appreciate him coming. Sir? Thanks. How's everybody doing today? Yeah, it's good to see quite a crowd. I was a little concerned. I saw a big gap over here, and I'm like, man. It's like church. Nobody wants to sit in the front row except for you unfortunate folks, right? Just kidding. All right, today, what I'm going to go through is it's referred to as a PME on PME, but it's the importance of personal professional development. We're going to talk about different aspects of PME. We're going to talk about why I think it's important. It should be a discussion. I'm going to ask questions. I'll wait for somebody to raise their hand to respond, you know, because there's always awkward, you know, like, I don't want to be the person raising my hand. You all know what it's like. But if I don't get folks raising their hand, I'm going to point people out because I want your input. I want you to tell me what you think. And at the end of it, it's open season. Ask anything you want related to this, related to something else, what's going on in the Marine Corps, what you've heard, what you've seen. We lost the screen. <laughs> Completely lost the screen. Cobble's on it, sir. It's Murphy's. Oh, okay. Just got to reboot. Anything going on in the Marine Corps whatsoever, all right? The reason we do this, or the reason I do this, is because I've been concerned for a number of years now that we, as leadership of our Marine Corps, because that, that's what all of us are, as soon as you gain that red stripe, you're part of the leadership of the Marine Corps. I don't believe we do enough of it. I don't believe we do enough of it. And there's a friend of mine named Dr. Williamson Murray who's written a, a pretty large number of books uh, they're actually very, very good if you ever want to read some of them. He's an eminent military historian. But one of the things he says is that our profession is the most difficult profession on the face of the earth, the most intellectually and physically challenged profession on the face of the earth. And if you think about it, it's right. Because what's the cost of us not doing, it, not doing it right? Lives, national security, kind of important. Okay? We've got a lot of challenges out there. Things are really, really busy. But one of the things that I equate this to is, how many of you in here would go to a lawyer that passed the bar exam and then never studied again? Said, I'm good, don't need to do this anymore. Or even worse, a doctor. Passed all the requirements to become a fully fledged doctor and then never studied another thing again. For those of us, think about your peers and think about what you do for those of us in this profession, it's, that's the equivalent, if you're not getting after it, all right? And it's a personal decision for each and every single one of us, because it's not just what you're doing, but it's when, as you get increase in rank in the Marine Corps, you get a larger and larger slice of the Marine Corps pie that you are in charge of, and everything you expect inspect and enforce is what's going to happen in that unit, that organization, okay? So it's up to each of us. Quote from General Dempsey, renewing the commitment to the profession of arms. This is what he was aiming for when he was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And this is why I'm talking to you today, because that's what we need to be, the best trained force in the world. How many of you keep track of uh, the news? Lots of opportunities to excel out there, aren't there? Lots of people that don't like us. They've been watching us for the last 10, 15 years, what we're good at and what we're bad at. So how many people do you think are going to step up to the plate and fight us toe-to-toe -to -toe like Saddam Hussein did, not just once, but twice? Dumbest thing on the face of the earth. You've got to be kidding me. Okay? There aren't too many other people lining up to do something similar. Take a read on that. Soldiering as an agreeable and honorable occupation rather than as a serious profession demanding no less intellectual dedication than the doctor, the lawyer, or the engineer. Think about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis with regards to your profession. Think about what your peers do or don't do on a daily basis with regards to your profession. Does any of this apply to us? Just think about it. Okay? 
So tell me, in your mind, aside from the obvious things we just mentioned, what constitutes a profession? In your own words, who's going to volunteer for that one? Bueller? Please. Giving back to the institution? Yes, sir. Well, okay. Like write articles, like doctors write like medical journals, and things of that nature that kind of continues to progress the institution. Okay. Thank you. You have to profess something. You have to, like what Kathy was saying, you have to uh, have a, put a teaching in place, uh, a way, a way of life. Okay. Thanks. Anybody else about what constitutes profession? Please. A deeper issue, sir. I'm sorry? A deeper issue. Okay. Why would you want to do that? To get better. To get better. Or to learn? Right. To learn? Yeah. Please. Sir, uh, you're certified by professional board, sir. Uh, like the doctors or the lawyers. The peer, the peer group has to accept you, sir. Okay. After passing the exam. Okay. Well, here's the definition of a profession. Who wants to pick out a couple of things that stand out in this? as, yep, that's exactly what it means by profession. That's what I thought. Or by the same token, if you're surprised by something that's on there. What stands out? Warranted by society. Warranted by society. What does that mean? To me, sir, it means that there is a, you can't have a profession without a demand for the service provided. Okay. And by the same token, then, the folks that expect that service trust that you can do it correctly, right? Yeah, big part of that. What else on here? Specialized knowledge. Sir. Specialized knowledge, like what? Uh, like for any, any, for example, for our one, the O3s, the amount of information knowledge that you acquire for us to actually imply our employees, our web systems, our, our men and our equipment in a way that can be accessible at any time, any seat, or any place. Great. Thanks, Jeffrey. Who else got something that stands out? repetitively over and over with a certain result. Uh, profession indicates that you're never truly complete, uh, that you're able to improve in said profession. Always able to improve, right? You're never, if you consider yourself to be a master of something, you're probably setting yourself up, setting yourself up for failure. Yes, sir. Okay, anything else on this one? Okay, and then how's that related to what's on the very last sentence? A reputation. How hard is it to build a good reputation? It takes continuous effort, right? How quickly do you, can you lose that reputation? In a heartbeat, and most of the time it's given away. It's not lost, it's given away. Okay, this is the profession of arms. Tell me what's different. Please. The cost of failure, okay. Much higher in our profession of arms, yeah. What else? What stands out? Sir, the ethical application. There you go, why? Uh, because, sir, when we, like, when we study, there's like a technical aspect of what we do, and then and we talk about it like the art and science. Uh, naturally, we say it has an ethical component to serve a good one in human lives, and how do you marry that up with the technical side of the house so that we're successful and continue to grow? Okay, but on the battlefield in particular, that ethical application, what does that mean? How does that mean, what does that mean in practice? The study part is very, very important, but what does it mean in practice? What do we do? We, we kill people and break things, right? We're out there as a safe life. Yes, we kill people and break things. So why would an ethical application of combat power mean, why would that be important? Yes, if we don't have it, right? Absolutely. We answer to higher authority, and that's actually the people of the United States. Absolutely. Because there's other organizations out there that don't care. Perfect example, I was a target engagement authority in Iraq, June of 15 and June of 16. And the Iraqis wanted us to blow up everything. And of course, we wouldn't do that. And we were very concerned with collateral damage and killing civilians. So we are pretty careful about it. Much more careful than they wanted to be, and it was their country, for God's sake. You've got to be kidding me. 
And then the Russians came into Syria and were bombing anything and everything and causing a lot of civilian casualties. And at first, the Iraqis were like, hey, wh why don't you do that? My response to them was, just wait. Wait for it. Here it comes. And within a month, they're kind of like, oh my god. I'm glad you don't do that. Because they're smashing everything. And of course, because they're willing to lie about things and deny any of it's ever happening. Ethical application, right? What else do you see on there? Anything else stand out? Constitution, Constitution why? Absolutely. Because there are quite a few militaries over the course of history, and some even in existence today, that swear their oath to a person or party, not to the Constitution that supports the government. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Do you realize we've probably gone longer than any other nation on the face of the earth where the military has not stepped in and taken over because they didn't like what was going on? It's mainly because of the Constitution. Some countries don't understand it at all. You go to Nigeria or other places, and they look at you like, why are you putting up with this stuff? Well, there's a reason why we're the country we are, and they're the country they are. Okay? Enough said on that one. Anything else stand out? Okay. Here are the foundations of our profession. Anything surprise you on there? Any surprises at all? Professions require these sorts of things. They're the documents, it's the rules of that profession. They form the ethics of our profession. What's right, what's wrong within the profession. Not just the morality, but the ethics in particular of that profession, okay? How many of you live up to, don't raise your hand, how many of you live up to what this says at the top of the screen? That's what this is about. Continuous improvement no matter what. Not just yourself, but the organization you're in charge of and trying to make the Marine Corps better all the time. We don't have enough people doing it. We don't have enough people focused on it. But that's what you do as a professional. You do things that you maybe not want to do, uncomfortable, difficult, inconvenient, but you do it because it's a requirement of your profession and you understand very clearly it's not about you, it's about the organization you belong to and the Marines you're leading. Okay? When we do this, that enhances the reputation of the Marine Corps. We have a very good reputation. I'm not saying it's all bad. We have a very, very good reputation. The legacy that's been handed off by the folks that have gone before us, people like Sergeant Major Canley and others, is exceptionally good. But as we talked about earlier, there's a special trust and confidence when we raise our right hand. I realize I just raised my left hand. When we raise our right hand, we're, in deep, we're imbued with a special trust and confidence that only comes in this line of work. The American people have for the Marine Corps. And as we talked about earlier, the reputation that we have takes a long time to build and maintain, but it can easily be lost, right? Who knows what that upper left-hand corner picture is? Anybody? What do you know about it? Yep. How many, do you think, how many things do you think the commandant has to do on a daily basis? Anyone want to take a guess? Kind of a busy job, maybe? He spent four days explaining that one. Four whole days focused on not a whole lot more than what some bored Marines decided to video 
in, in, out in Iraq. It was actually, it wasn't just a dog, it was a puppy. Threw him off a cliff. Four days explaining it. So what does that do? What about the upper right-hand corner? Everybody knows what that one is, right? Do you know what the bottom one is? What's that flag mean? Anybody know? What's that? The Waffen SS, right. They didn't know that. They might have, but they wouldn't admit they knew it. They thought it was just cool because it said, you know, they scout snipers. So for people who don't know much about the Marine Corps, which is much of the American population, if this is the only thing they ever see of the Marine Corps, what does that do for our reputation and our credibility? What do you think? If we're professionals and these kind of things happen inside our organization, that's a problem, right? Okay. Just think about it. Okay. Who wants to stand up and tell me what PME means to you? In your own words, what does PME mean? What do you think? Sort of a grounding back in, the, in where you came from. So a grounding? A grounding service. Okay. Uh, it helps you get back to what sort of made you who you were. Okay. Thanks. What else? So it's also that continuing education from the grounding. Okay, great. A couple good shots. All right. Sir, I think it's being able to look through uh, education through a different lens other than just your own MOS uh, and then being able to actually look at how you can educate yourself throughout the Marine Corps through someone else's experience. Yep. So. Thanks. We'll hear more on that. Here's what General Dempsey thinks about PME. Here's what he thinks the importance of it is. Habits of mind. Why would they need to, be, need to become habits? What do you think? So they become actions, sir. So they become actions, repetitive actions, maybe? Yeah. Sir, we need these things to be habits uh, because if they're not habits, then at the toughest moments, they're not going to be there for us. We're going to revert back to whatever our habits are when we're in the most stressful situations. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So what happens when you don't PT? Excuse me, when you don't, I'm sorry. Got ahead of myself. I consider PME to be PT for the brain. All right. So what happens if you know PT? What? Atrophy. Atrophy. Start pushing maximum density in utilities, right? How good are you at your job, especially if it's physically demanding, you're in a physically demanding MOS, how good at your job if you decide, I don't need PT anymore? I'm good. I'm at a rank where, you know, hey, who's going to hold me accountable? I don't need to keep PT in. Okay? That's the same thing with regards to your brain. You stop using your brain, it starts deteriorating. They've actually done studies with folks that have Alzheimer's, and the folks that have stopped engaging themselves, stopped studying, stopped reading, studying a language, believe it or not, helps with synaptic connections in the brain and keeps them more alert and focused over time. Because then you have the other folks that sit in front of the television and turn the brain off. There was actually a study done that indicated there's more brainwave activity when you're asleep than when you're watching television. And that's just one activity, okay? Some other activities out there that keep you from doing what you should be doing with regards to studying your profession are things like blogging. I'm not saying don't, do, don't blog, I'm not saying don't watch TV, but one of the things you in particular have to be careful with blogging is something they call the echo chamber effect. Who knows what that is? Anybody? Echo chamber effect? I sort of where you present an idea uh, in a group that generally believes what you're saying already. Uh, therefore, the idea is they push back to you either to affirm your biases uh, or reinforce them in some way. Yeah. And a lot of the blogs are reinforcing that effect, that echo chamber effect. Because the only people in the blog with you are people that think exactly like you do. So we must all be right, right? Yeah. How many consider this to be PT? So if you pick up a book and it's tough to read, and you're trying to work your way through it, what do you feel like when you finally put the book down? You tired? Yeah, mentally tired? 
Sounds like PT to me. Okay? But it does make your brain better. The more you challenge yourself, the better you become. Okay? So I do consider this to be PT. Because this professionalism, again, hard to develop and, hard, and very perishable, and it must be refreshed at every opportunity. We are never good enough at anything we do. The more competent we are, the more confident we are as leaders. But then there's that whole thing, you know, promotion, moving to jobs at higher ranks. How many of you feel completely comfortable moving into a new job, especially if you just got promoted and then moved into a new job? Anybody? Confident, comfortable, fully ready to be there? That's perfectly normal. But there are some folks that at least appear to be very, very confident and can do no wrong. I'm sure you've seen them just like I have, right? Thomas Friedman wrote a couple of books. One's called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Well, World is Flat and Hot, Flat, and Crowded is the second one. A bit dated right now. What he talks about is how fast things are moving in this world and how hard it is to keep up. What does that quote mean to you down there? What do you think? Still got to work for your opportunities. That's right. Anybody else? Lifetime employability, wasn't me. That's right. You start to coast, you get comfortable. There's a lot of folks in the Marine Corps that think we have a zero defect mentality. If you think that, please raise your hand. Please. So nobody in here thinks that. Is that, is that the case? Or nobody's willing to raise their hand? One. Which one? One up front? Okay, there you go, thank you. They're all, but they're actually, you're not alone. Despite the fact that nobody else in here raised their hand, you're not alone, okay? There are a lot of people that think that. I've sat on a number of promotion boards, and what I'm here to tell you is we are such a competitive organization that any little thing that makes you a little less competitive makes you a little less promoted or selected for school or for whatever. And on a number of those boards, there are a number of folks that I can't honestly explain why they weren't promoted or why they weren't sent to a school, or why they weren't picked for a command. They're good Marines. They've done a really, really good job at every job they've had. They just weren't good enough. That's just the reality of up or out, okay? Uh, there are a number of folks that would love to be able to sit at the rank for a certain amount of time and just, hey, I don't, I don't want to get any more senior. I'm just going to hang out here. We used to do that in the military. How many knew that? You had to wait for the people above you to either die or retire. How's that for encouraging? Spending 15 years at a rank. Everyone want to volunteer to go back to those days? So that's what the upper out drives. No, much, no such thing as lifetime, employ, lifetime employment anymore. You're not guaranteed a job. Okay, you gotta bring your A game. From the Army Future Report. Future of the Army Report. Two years ago. What do you think? Do you think we have this problem? Yes? No? Maybe? From, please. Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of Marines looking at a lot of the problems that we see, sir, through the OIF uh, lens, because that's what the majority of their experience is, sir. OK, yeah. But you think about that OIF, OEF, and the people we were fighting, how good were they? Not very good, sir. Right. There's a real, the reason why the Israelis are largely undefeated, right? They fight Arab armies, okay? They're just not that good. There's a whole entire culture, I've worked with them for almost three years, their entire culture mitigates against their ability to be an effective military. It's just the way it is. They know it, okay? They probably would admit it to you. Um, so you look at that, the type of foe we were fighting, so we, number of folks, by looking around the room, number of folks with combat experience in here, how valuable is that for what we have going ahead of us? Somewhat valuable. I'm not saying it's a total loss. But in some ways, it could also be a detriment because of overconfidence, right? I got this. I'm a combat veteran. Okay? Something to think about. 
Anyone want to take a guess at how good we are at predicting the next fight? We have an almost perfect track record of picking the next fight. We're wrong almost every single time. Okay? Wrong almost every single time. There's a guy named Sir Michael Howard, though, who says, yeah, that's normal. We just have to make sure we're not too far wrong, and then we have to be able to adjust quickly once we get into the fight. Okay? That's what's important about that. Okay. This is what we're trying to build, right? Knowledge and experience gives you wisdom. When Secretary Mattis was commanding general of 1st Marine Division, a reporter was watching him make decisions in the march up. And he was presented with some, a really sticky situation, and he made the decision in about 30 seconds. And the reporter was just astounded. He was like, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. He's like, it only took you about 30 seconds to make that decision. He's like, no, actually, you're wrong. It took him about 30 years to make that decision. Because the amount of studying of his profession he's done over the course of his career, it all lended to the wisdom that he built up over time. Okay? When it comes to experience, though, how much choice do you have on the type of experience you get in the Marine Corps? What do you think? If a war happens and you're stationed here at Quantico, or in my case, when this one kicked off, I was in the Pentagon kicking myself, had been told to sit down, shut up, don't ask to go anywhere. Don't have a whole lot of choice in that matter. Luckily, it went on long enough, I was able to get involved with it. All right? But I can't begin to tell you how frustrated I was, and I'm sure some of you have had that experience too. For the folks that are coming in after all this is over, they're very frustrated also because they missed it, they think. One good thing about the Marine Corps, you stick around long enough, you're going to be in a fight. That's what we do. Okay? So there's two types of experience then. There's actual experience, and then what's the other experience? Somebody said it. What do you think? What's the other type of experience? Sorry? Yeah. Some people call it vicarious experience. How do you get vicarious experience? Reading. Reading. Learn from what others have done. Learn from what others have done. You have a choice in that every single day, whether you take advantage of that or not. That's the 30 years experience that Secretary Mattis was talking about for all the things he did in the course of his life, studying. They call him the warrior monk. He wasn't married. When he was up at the top of the hill there in, in, uh, in quarters one, when he was in charge of McSiddick, People laughed about his house because it was all books and almost no furniture. Okay? But that's how seriously he took it. Because the other piece about this is the education we get can never be taken away from us, no matter how much money they take away. And oh, by the way, that nice big defense bill that was just signed, next year is going to be lower, and then it's going to be, we're at the high water mark right now. Money's going to start heading south again. And if Congress flips, which some people are saying it will, do you know what's still out there? Has not been removed? Sequestration, the Budget Control Act. And we never saw the full effects of sequestration. It could have gotten a lot worse. And it may get a lot worse. Between World War I and World War II, the German army was cut down to 100,000 soldiers. No planes, no tanks, no artillery pieces, hardly any weapons. They had almost no money. Their country was an absolute basket case. And what they focused on was the education of their small unit leaders, like a laser beam. So they had a bias for action, a bias for intelligent action. And they would get after it. So when they expanded, when that knucklehead Hitler got in charge, when they expanded the military, they had a cadre of leadership that they spread out across that force that made them virtually unbeatable. When we were planning D-Day with the British, one of the planning considerations was we could not match them unit to unit. They were much better than we were. We had to overwhelm them and drive them into the ground. And that army held together all the way into the spring of 1945 after one disaster after another because of decisions that the knucklehead in charge of them made. Thank God they had an idiot in charge, or we really would have had a problem. Okay? That's the importance of education. 
I'm not saying we're going to go to those kind of days, but things can get pretty dicey. The other aspect that I was, for the, the young folks in the room, the lower ranking, right now the physical challenges are more important than the intellectual challenges. You've got to have the ability to lead those young Marines that you're in charge of at the squad leader, squad level, platoon level, et cetera. But as you get more senior, the things you're faced with, the challenge you're faced with become more mental challenges, intellectual challenges. Are you going to be smart enough? That's what I worry about every single day. Am I going to be smart enough? When I get faced with some challenges, I've never even, like, what the hell was that? Whenever you're faced with something new, there's a reaction people talk about. They usually throw in a couple expletives, but it's kind of like a, what the hell do I do now? What the hell do I do now? How helpful is that in a combat situation? Or if you're placed in charge, you've got to figure something out. How helpful is that when all your subordinates are looking at you? What the hell do I do now? Some people refer to that as a Peter Principle. Promoted beyond the ability to deal with what's happening in front of you. Okay? The future operating environment is getting more and more difficult. The Australian Chief of Defense put it this way. He said, we've never really been able to count on a quantitative edge. We generally don't outnumber the people we're fighting. And it's getting to the point where we can't count on a technological edge either. Because technology is proliferating so fast and getting so cheap and getting so dangerous that we can't count on an edge there either. So what's left? And he refers to it as the intellectual edge. The ability to outthink the enemy no matter what. You get a curveball thrown at you, you figure it out. Quickly. Bias for action, understand intent, get after it. Okay? That's hard. That's tough business. Not everybody can do it. Absolute requirement in our, in our line of work. Experience, we've got to meet those demands because it is getting more demanding. This is the information environment. How many feel like this on a day-to-day -day basis? How the hell do you deal with that? What's that? How's that, how's, how do you think that's working for that guy? Probably sucks. Probably sucks, that's right. How do you deal with something like this? What's, what is the essential way to deal with a crap load of stuff hitting you in the face? Prioritize. Prioritize, yeah. What else? You plan for it. Okay, thanks. What else? There's one word I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay. Also very hard. What's the, what's the first word you used? Filter. Yes. You need a filter. So of all the stuff hitting them in the face, how much of that's important? Of all the stuff hitting you in the face every day, what's important and what's not? What do you need to read? What do you need to push aside? Especially when time gets short. It's called a filter. Got to have it. How do you develop that? Tell me what critical thinking means to you. What is critical thinking? Being critical? You deal with that out here. I know you teach it. So what's critical thinking? Sure, I'll say uh, the ability to break down a problem and solve it step by step in order to gain the overall goal of the problem. OK, that's certainly part of it, yes. What else is it? Related to what we were just talking about, what else is it? Sure, the ability to look at a problem, look at it from as many different sides as possible, determine which aspects of the problem are the most relevant. Okay. So, in order to be able to do that, what kind of mind do you have to have? You need to be intellectually elastic in order to be able to take a new, new concept, have things that aren't necessarily related to what you're dealing with that you've learned about. Okay. They apply to the problem you're dealing with. Okay. Open minded, maybe? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's hard to do. But it's also taking things with a grain of salt. Not taking everything hook, line, and sinker. How many of you know that the Russians have an active information campaign going against us pretty much all the time? Putting out information that people kind of want to believe about going on, but maybe be completely inaccurate. So think about this. 
We get in a pretty big fight with them. The balloon goes up, we're trying to deploy, and your Marines are getting text messages, or they're seeing things in their Facebook, or whatever else. Things that are very disturbing to them. Things about stuff that be go may be going on at home, or not. Are they able to deal with that sort of thing? Are they able to think through it? Or are they just gonna take a hook, line, and sinker? What about you? Okay. Being able to think, look at something and not take it at face value and think about it with that grain of salt is tremendously important because there's a lot of information out there. It's about having a filter. I read quite a bit about decision making. A lot of different theory out there, but the way I break it down is in three different ways. How many of you are familiar with the Marine Corps planning process? Should be everybody, because you, you kind of teach aspects of it here, right? Colonel Everly, you, you, you do teach aspects of it here, right? Sparingly. Sparingly, okay. That's the analytical process. It's taking a bunch of people, bringing them together, pulling in all the information that's available. It's a time-consuming process. You need to have good information. It's looking at all the different options that are out there. Okay? Time-consuming, information required. A lot of information required. How often do you get those? A lot of time, a lot of information. Okay? Not very often. Which is why the next level is called recognition prime decision making. Chess players use this. They've played enough chess that they can kind of recognize patterns going on in front of them and recognize or come up with the ability to beat that pattern and then get faster and faster. But it requires a lot of knowledge and experience, right? The top level is intuitional decision making. That center book there, Blink, Malcolm Gladwell talks about it. It's the ability to just know. He has another book called Outliers where he says if you do something for 10,000 hours, you get to the point where it's just unconscious. You do it when you're driving. You make intuitional level decisions when you're driving. Because you've been doing it for so long, ideally, that you make good decisions. You recognize things that are going on. One of the case studies he talks about there in Blink is uh, a group of folks got really excited because they dug up the, what they thought was an ancient sculpture. They're like, wow, we're going to make a lot of money off this. This is fantastic. They're trying to clean it up a little bit. They're getting more and more excited about it because it looked like some of the things they'd seen before. An expert walked in and, one, and blink of an eye, like, that's a fake. How the hell did you know that? He'd been dealing with those things for so long, he knew. There was just something wrong with it. It wasn't right. And when they did the, the age testing of it, they realized, yeah, it's a fake. Okay? So if you're following a leader, especially in a combat situation where things are moving pretty quick, what type of leader do you want? <coughs> Intuitional decision maker, right? The challenge is a lot of people think they can do this, but can't. Their ego tells them they can do it. I got this. How many of you have heard that one before? I got this. <coughs> Followed by an even more famous remark, watch this. Okay? It's hard. Hard business. The challenge you have with this is ego and bias. Anybody know what that top picture is? You want to take a guess? Glippoli, no, nope, not glippoli, but close. Yeah, Thanks. It was actually uh, the Russian line in the Jap uh, fighting the Japanese. So Russo-Japanese War, 1905. Close. You're close. Okay. Russo-Japanese War in 1905. Everything that made World War I a slaughter existed in this war in 1905. Fast-firing artillery, barbed wire, machine guns. The Europeans and the Americans all sent observers over there to watch the fighting, see what we can learn here. What do you think we learned from that? Am I going to take a guess? Nothing. We learned nothing. Look at the, what the folks are wearing on their feet. Jesus, they're barefoot. What do we learn from these rubes? Are you kidding me? And of course, then we realize they're, they're barefoot because that's the best way to do a trench foot, right? In the mud and wet, as long as it's not too cold. Okay? The Russians are very simplistic about things. How many of you hear that story about uh, John Glenn, the, uh, the astronaut and the senator, when he's talking to a Russian cosmonaut? He's bragging about the pen that writes upside down, writes in anti-gravity. It's fantastic. You know, engineers, this, this thing's fantastic. And the Russian just looks at him and pulls out a pencil. Okay? Keep it simple. But going back, what's the bottom picture? It's 
World War I. More specifically, July 1st, 1916. Almost two years after the war started. On July 1st, 1916, the British attacked on the Somme River. 60,000 casualties in one day. Fast firing artillery, barbed wire machine guns. 60,000 casualties in one day. That battle went on for four months. They gained maybe a total of two miles. Again, we knew about this in 1905, right? We did not join the war. We declared war in April of 1917. We didn't actually start fighting until the spring of 1918 because we were so unprepared. So the war started in August of 1914. We really started fighting about May of 1918 and went from May till the war was over in November of 1918 and lost over 100,000 casualties in just that short period because we hadn't learned anything either. And when we got into it, the British and the French were trying to tell us, look, we're going to explain these things to you, some of the realities out here. You've got to understand, thanks, we've got this, okay? We've watched you people make a mess of this thing for the last couple of years. We know what we're doing. When the Marine Corps attacked on June 6, 1918, into Bellow Wood across the wheat field, we took more casualties in that one day than we'd taken in the entire history of the Marine Corps up to that point. There was no barbed wire because Germans hadn't a chance to set it up yet, but there were machine guns and artillery. Okay? Got to learn. We have to learn. Because this is our problem today. It goes back to what I was talking about earlier. Who's going to be stupid enough to stand toe to toe with us? It'd be like me getting in the ring with Mike Tyson. Stupid. Okay? Even old and retired that he probably is, he still, probably still knocked the crap out of me. All right? So who's going to volunteer to step into that ring with Mike Tyson? Okay? This is what our enemy's trying to do right here. Find ways to get after us without stepping into the ring with us. Okay? There's a book that you can get via PDF from the Strategic Studies Institute of the Army War College. It's called Mastering the Gray Zone. It's talking about what the Russians and the Chinese are doing to get what they want around the world by salami slicing, by showing some patience, which we don't have, to get what they want in small slices. Create facts on the ground, keep things just below our threshold to react. And every time they do something, it makes us that more difficult for us to do anything about it. How do you deal with that? That is the million dollar question. Because we have to continually learn, continually better. If we, any of us think we are good enough, our units are good enough, the status quo is good enough, that we don't need to climb anymore, because you know that takes a lot of effort, we got a problem. Six different times in the history of the Marine Corps, they've tried to get rid of us. Tried to get rid of the Marine Corps, six different times. There are people talking about that it may, they may make another run on us. Because the Army is talking a lot about, hey, they're just a second land army. We can do all that stuff. We don't need them. You've heard the stories. Okay? That's the kind of threat that we have to pay attention to in addition to what's out there actually shooting at us. We have to be aware of that. All right? And then there's the things that pop up. You have no idea what it's about. In the summer of 1994, actually late spring, I was a rifle company commander at Camp Lejeune. Just as happy as could be. Rifle company, we're training, everything's nice. And then we get pulled to go to Operation Sea Signal to deal with the Haitians coming out of Haiti. And because we couldn't go to, and put them in camps in Cuba, because the Clinton administration, when they were running for election, had called President Bush, uh, said that they were putting them in concentration camps. They're like, well, we can't do that again. They decided to hire a Ukrainian cruise ship, for which my rifle company got to be the security on. They took the hospital ship Comfort took all the medical stuff off, put a bunch of INS agents and another company from our battalion. We sailed down to Jamaica, and we're processing Haitian migrants in Kingston Harbor, Jamaica. Coast Guard would pick them up from the little boats, bring them to the hospital ship Comfort, where about 98% of them got screened out, which meant they're going to get sent back to Haiti, which they just risked their life to leave, and then they were given to us on the cruise ship to hold on to until the Coast Guard could come pick them up again and take them back to Haiti. What do you think their mindset was? 
Anybody know if that's covered anywhere in any manuals? Do you think we conducted any training whatsoever to deal with that? Wait, Ukrainian cruise ship, are you kidding me? I'm bringing this up, and oh, by the way, it ended with us going to Cuba anyways because we got inundated by Haitians, and just when the Haitians started to slow down, the Cubans came out in about three times the numbers, okay? All summer long. Riot control, hold on. Marines actually thoroughly enjoyed the riot control operation. We got to thump people, and they thought it was the best thing in the world. I had one of my Marines walk me, I'll re-enlist right now, okay? I bring that up because all the conditions that made that happen exist today. This could happen again tomorrow or next week. And because we are who we are, the Marine Corps, expeditionary, ready to go no matter what, who do you think they're going to turn to? Which one of you is going to end up doing the same thing? You just never know. In any brief, it's always good to have a Chinese proverb, okay? Should be self-explanatory. But these are the kind of things I think about right here. If we're not learning from other folks, shame on us, because there's more than plenty of opportunity to do so. Read that quote. True today? Nineteen sixteen is when that guy said it. Is it true today? Even more so now, right? How many of you know anybody in here speak German? Room full of Americans. Nobody speaks another language, right? No, I'm just kidding. Upper left hand corner. The word Bildung can be translated a couple different ways. The way I translate it is the burning desire to know. Intellectual curiosity. Getting after it. Understanding that you will never know enough, especially about our profession. You will never know enough. I finish on average three books a week. I'm not telling you that to brag. I'm tired because I am convinced I will never ever be smart enough. And what I'm worried about is running a situation I'm not equal to, that I have no idea what to do about. And the amount of reading I do does not give me answers, but help me come up with answers much more readily. But I have an intellectual desire, intellectual curiosity, a burning desire to know. I want to know. I want to know everything. Training prepares you for what we know we're going to face. We're trying to give ourselves muscle memory, those tasks, setting a machine gun reacting to an ambush, whatever it is. Those are tasks that we need to fall into habitually, instinctively. And then what? Because that's just the initial reaction. And then what? Especially when the enemy does something you don't expect. How do you adjust to that? Okay, that's the hard part. So in thinking about our world, I got a video to show you just to get you thinking about the kind of stuff we, we think we're looking at out in the operating forces, in the operating environment out ahead of us. Go ahead, please.
Thanks. All right, if you couldn't tell, the Air Force made that. Some Air Force propaganda. So what does that make you think about? What are your impressions having just sat there and watched that? Who wants to read? Who wants to say, raise their hand and say something? What do you think about? Gunny, what do you think about? It sort of kind of makes me think about uh, you know, things are ever changing, and how quickly things can change from what it was in the early 1900s to now, and just in the last 10 years. You know, things are, the, the changes that we saw in the first you know, 50 years are happening now within like five or 10 years, and where we're going to be at in the next five years. Okay, thanks. You raise your hand. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, it makes me think about how scary technology really is, sir. So the can airplane be. wasn't invented for military purposes. It's to travel. Next thing you know, uh, we're dropping bombs using them, sir. Dropping bombs from them. That's right. Okay. How many of you saw the uh, Lady Gaga's halftime show at the Super Bowl a couple of years ago? Anybody? Saw the 300 drones with the lights and stuff? Three years ago, the software for that could handle 10,000 drones. Think about weaponizing 10,000 drones. Don't even need big ones if you've got 10,000 drones, right? You can do all kinds of stuff with 10,000 drones, especially if they're acting with one brain. How do you deal with that? If you aren't uncomfortable about things like this and about the pace of technology and about the impact it may have on us, if you aren't reading about it, trying to keep up with it, trying to see what's next, I want to think about it because it's tough. And then there's Secretary Mattis again. Because this is how I think about it, with a 5,000-year-old mind, okay? Studying vice just reading, understanding what's out there. Because again, it doesn't give you the answers, it helps you come up with the answers. Because in essence, the nature of war has not changed. Nature of war is still, we are trying to inflict our will on somebody else. The characteristics of war change all the time. That's what usually kills a lot of people when you're not keeping up with it. But the nature never changes. We're dealing with human beings. Our own human beings get them to try to do things they really don't want to do. And the folks that oppose us trying to impose our will on them. Because that's what it's about, right? You look at these four, uh, six gentlemen here, all four stars. The only time in the Marine Corps we've ever had four stars at one time. Each one of them lifelong students of their profession. <coughs> Dealt with some absolutely amazing things in Afghanistan. Intractable problems, what we refer to as wicked problems, which means they don't really have a solution. Each one of them prepared to be there when they got there. As opposed to this guy. Anybody want to know who this guy is? Okay, you read the name tape, right? No, no I'm just, I'm kidding, it's up. General Westmoreland, Graduated from West Point in 1936 as a second lieutenant. By 1945, he was a full bird colonel. Fought through all the way through World War II and our involvement there. Artillery regimental commander. Been there, done that, seen it all, just asking. Never studied his profession again, if he ever did in the first place. He was offered the opportunity to go to the Army War College. He said, I want to go there. I'll go there to teach if you want, but I don't need to, I don't need to go there as a student. What, are you kidding me? In 1964, he was put in charge in Vietnam as a four-star general. He had two tasks. Figure out the type of war you're in and figure out a way to win it. And failed on both counts. He was in charge for four years in Vietnam. If you're interested in reading about it, there's a retired Army colonel named Louis Sorley who wrote Westmoreland, The Man Who Lost the War. Anybody want to have a book like that written about him? And then he wrote another one called A Better War, which is about the guy who replaced him, this guy named Creighton Abrams, who understood exactly what was going on, got us on a good path, but by then the American public had run out of patience and pulled the plug in the bathtub. Forget it, we're done, get out. So whose fault is that? Is it the American public's fault? No, it's our fault. And we almost did it again in Iraq because we couldn't get it figured out. Too many people went there with a, a vision in their mind of what they wanted to do, the type of fight they wanted to fight, regardless of the reality on the ground. Some people would say the same thing's going on in Afghanistan. It has been for quite a while. When I was in the Marine Corps Tax and Operations Group, we were circulating two after-action reports from company commanders. 
one who clearly understood what was required in a counterinsurgency environment, and all the things he did with his rifle company, just fantastic. Really moved the ball forward, really helped out the situation, didn't make it worse. The other company commander, it was, it was an email that he'd circulated around with the attitude like, uh, here's what we did, if you don't agree, you're stupid. That was the tone of the email. Flood the farmer's fields, takes care of IED, screw the farmers, they're all a bunch of idiots anyways. They're all enemy. How much damage does that company do? Because as we all know, our Marines take on the persona of the leader, right? So how much damage do you think that company did? Those are Marines. How many of you have heard a book called Black Hearts? Some of you read it? Appalling lack of leadership. Appalling things going on in that Army unit. And they weren't alone, I'm here to tell you. They weren't alone, okay? It's still going on. People don't understand, don't want to understand. How much education did this guy have? Formal education. Two years. He had two years of formal education, that's it. Some people think he's one of our smartest presidents. How much preparation do you think he had before he became President of the United States and was faced with the Civil War? Handed that nice big steaming bag of you know what by his predecessor who did nothing as states were leaving the Union. But he personally studied his entire life. And when he realized it was going to be a fight, he started studying military theory. And it turns out he actually knew more than his generals did because some of his generals wouldn't get going, and he's like, you know what, you're fired. He fired several before he finally found one, Grant, who would do what needed to be done. The war started in 1861. He put Grant in charge in 1864. Not a good track record. You've got the article. Open to questions on it. That's what I think we ought to be doing. You may hear more on that. Education Command's working on something in that regard, okay? But some people talk about, okay, so if you're gonna study your profession, how wide of a net do you need to be able to cast? What all should you be looking at if you're trying to study and understand all aspects of your profession? Lieutenant General Van Riper retired, told me this, and I'm sure there's other things that could be added, but this is what he said. This is what was on his mind. Anything surprising on there? Like, why, why the heck's on that on there? What do you think? Anything surprising? Systems theory, too. Systems theory? Yes, sir. Why, would you, why is it surprising? Uh, it sounds more, more like a STEM topic, sir, than a military topic. Okay. More of a STEM topic than a military topic, except that everything we deal with is a system, right? So if you're trying to understand a system, and you pull a widget out of one part of that system, what impact does it have on the rest of the system? Okay? It's second and third order consequences. In many cases, when we make a decision, we don't consider second and third order consequences, you got a problem. Ooh, how the hell did that happen? What was that? It's because we don't really understand systems theory. Everything is interconnected. Things have an impact on other things. In many cases, some ways you don't, you don't, you don't really know. Okay? Anything else on there? One thing I would add is classic literature, especially some of the older stuff. How many of you have heard of the book Les Miserables? A couple people. Anybody know how thick that book is? It's huge. Someone once told me, if you ever want to understand the human condition, what makes people tick, read Les Miserables. Don't watch the movie. Read Les Miserables. It's hard. It's a workout, working your way through that thing, because the way they wrote back then, you, you, at, you know, for the first third of the book, you're like, what in the hell is going on? And they tie it all together. And it's like, holy cow. So I read it. It's fantastic. I would say to you that that has contributed to my knowledge of human beings and what makes them tick. Absolutely. But there's a lot more stuff out there like that. Okay? How many of you play chess? A couple? What kind of board, chess board do you play on? The regular one, right? You play on this one? Hmm? Anybody play on this one? When we're out there in the operating environment, no matter what rank you are, that's the chessboard we're all playing on. Because things you do at the lowest level, like get bored, 
take video of puppies being tossed off a cliff and splat, splattered, has, le has impacts at the highest levels. The impact of the sniper team from 3-2 urinating on the Taliban. There are some that think more Taliban fighters came out to fight us and killed Marines, soldiers, and sailors just because of that video. Same thing with Abu Ghraib. A minimally trained, poorly led, if led at all, National Guard unit guarding prisoners in Iraq decided to make it up as they went along and take pictures of it. Okay? Massive impacts. We all have to understand that. We have to make sure our Marines understand that. Okay? Because that's the board we're all dealing with. And this is part of the problem we have. We tend to be overconfident. We tend to get a little arrogant. We have that reputation around the world. There's a book, or excuse me, it's a monograph that the Combat Studies Institute of the Army put out. It's called We Were Caught Unprepared. It's about the Israeli army going into southern Lebanon in 2006. Previous 10 to 15 years, all they've been doing is low intensity conflict against the Palestinians. Sound familiar? They're complacent to the level that their combined armed skills and their TTP they weren't very good at all. In some cases, they've forgotten how to do it. And then they're overconfident. Well, we don't need that. They're just Arabs. We're fine. We'll be good. They're just going to run away as soon as they see the vaunted Israeli army. And they went against Hezbollah, who was a near-peer competitor, based on the technology they had, even though they were a non-state entity. And they took, the Israelis took it on the forehead with a two-by-four. It did not go well at all. And because they didn't clearly win one, they lost. And we have the same problem. If we don't clearly win, we lose the perception of the world. And my concern is to make sure nobody ever writes that one about us with the same title. We have to watch that. And it's not a new phenomenon either. How many of you saw the movie 300? Okay. Persians were the, they were, they were the superpower of the time. They're going out to fight some Greeks, and we're like, yeah, we're going to wipe the floor with these guys. They dare stand up to the, world, the superpower? Are you kidding me? But they're overconfident. They're careless. Careless has led to error, and they eventually lost. They didn't lose at Thermopylae. They lost about two battles later, completely lost. And then a guy named Alexander the Great, less than 100 years later, took it to him and totally wiped out the Persian Empire. Okay? That's the kind of thing we have to worry about, the overconfidence and the carelessness. I just spent two years out of 29 Palms watching us go through ITXs. I'd also, I also own Bridgeport, so I'd go up there to Bridgeport and watch them up there too. Stunning levels of complacency. And a year ago, I was in the Ukraine talking to them about, hey, what are the Russians doing over there? And they were very open with it all, showed it. Open kimono, here you go, here's all the things they're doing. And some of the success the Russians are having over there is because, frankly, Ukrainians aren't very good. Fact of life, they know it. They're trying to get better. They're working very hard to get better. But we'd be vulnerable, too. Something like the Ukrainian battalion commander said within two minutes of getting on his handset, he had rockets coming in on his position. And the, and the Russians don't do precision. They do mass. Just take out the grid square. So they're in there somewhere. How many of you think we'd have a problem with that? Yeah. How do you deal with it? Okay. Back to where we started. Oh, I'm sorry. One last one. I put this in there as if we need a reminder, but this is who pays the price. Okay. Not only does it have to do with national security and us, but more importantly, they're trusting to our professional abilities. Their parents their brothers and sisters are trusting to our professional ability. That's how important this is. Now it's back to the beginning. Again, it's a choice each and every once makes every single day. I'm not saying don't spend your time with your families. I'm not saying don't watch television. I'm not saying don't watch movies. I do all of the above. Okay? But I'm absolutely dedicated to studying my profession. And again, I'm convinced I will never ever be smart enough that's why I keep after it. So what questions do you have? Anything and everything. Please. Sir, how do you, you personally balance, uh, there's no man to be an expert on, on that subject, right? How do you balance what you're doing to the specific focus of yours and then maybe the uh, esoteric?
Paris knowledge for that one subject and then still being able to kind of not be in the dark on that uh, breadth of knowledge. Yep. Well, I, I, keep I have a couple different sources for keeping track of current events. Um, mostly they're, they're uh, a comp compilation of a lot of different news sources. I don't watch any of the network news or, or cable news or any of that stuff. It's all a bunch of nonsense, people yelling at each other. Um, so I watch that, and that kind of keys my thinking about some things. And then I go to places like Strategic Studies Institute, um, Brookings, uh, a couple other places where I'm trying to get at the people that are saying, okay, here's what happened, here's what we think that means. Okay? That kind of leads you in the direction of, you know what, I need to know more about that. But because many things are so complex, you can't just read one or two things about something. Like, for instance, the Battle of Gettysburg, which we're all familiar with, right? How complex was that Battle of Gettysburg? Do you think if you read one person's account of that battle, you're going to understand that battle thoroughly? You can memorize that doggone book, and it's still not going to have the impact you need it to have. I've read hundreds of books about Gettysburg. They could drop me anywhere on that place blindfold and pull my head, I could pull blindfold off and I'll know exactly where I am and I'll know what happened there in general. Not names, I'm not worried about names per se. I'm worried about what happened and why. Okay, that's how you get a better understanding of things. How many of you have heard of the, uh, the blind men, the three blind men in the room with the elephant? Okay, one blind man grabs the leg and he's this big huge tree trunk of a thing like what, what the hell is this? And he goes, well it seems like you know rough bark kind of thing, maybe it's a tree. Another guy grabs the tail with a little fluff on the end of it. Maybe it's, I have no idea what, a feather duster? I, I don't know. And the other guy's at the front end dealing with the trunk. Was it some kind of snake or something? Well, it's, it's pretty big. And the only way they're going to get an idea of what that thing truly is is when they all come together and talk about it, and you get the whole picture of it. It's almost like paper mache. You've got to put a bunch of things on it until it starts shaping, taking shape in your mind about what that really means, what that is. And just about any subject you think about, it's the same thing. My approach is I, I cast a very wide net when I'm reading. I always have about 15, 20 books going at the same time. Because some of them are hard. Like right now, I'm trying to read Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. It sucks. Okay? But somehow or other, people thought it was classic, you know, philosophy. I just have a hard time with philosophy, but I'm like, what? I'm, I want to understand what this guy's saying. Or try. And I have to take that in small bites and think about it. Other books are just for, I read a lot of historical fiction. Pretty entertaining, okay, especially if they're historically accurate. There's a guy named Bernard Cornwell who's a, wrote, written a great deal of historical fiction. Very entertaining books, okay, and historically accurate. At the end of the book, he tells you, here's what happened, here's what didn't happen, okay? But again, that leads you to other things. Oh, I want to know about that event he's talking about. How accurate was that? So I'll start reading about that. Okay? That's kind of one way to kind of shape your reading. But again, there's so many different things going on as things come up. Some of the things I'm trying to understand right now, quantum computing. Anybody know what that is? Anybody reading about it? Could have absolutely life-changing impact on us. I don't understand it very well right now. I can't explain it to you. I'm trying. Artificial intelligence. Who's reading about artificial intelligence? How many of you have seen the movie Terminator? based on artificial intelligence, right? Okay, whether we'll get to that point, I don't know. But there's a lot of people talking about, hey, this is some worrying trends in artificial intelligence. A few things to think about, okay? Thanks, answer your question? Sure. Okay, what else you got? Sure. Yes, please. What book or something you've read has had a disproportionate effect on you? Um, believe it or not, it's a book about an army officer. Once an Eagle by Anton Myra, another thick one. But his approach to life, the way he went after things, the way he studied his profession, in the, when, when, because it's historical fiction, but it was the most difficult time to be an army officer between World War I and World War II, when everybody's like, there will be no more wars. And all you folks who stayed in the military, you're a bunch of losers, you can't compete in the civilian world, you know, you're just, you're just, Leeches, sucking off the government dime. That's the attitude the American public had about the military. And folks like Dwight D. Eisenhower, George Patton, and a bunch of others, they stayed in. They studied their profession. That's what he did. He studied his profession. And the impact that, I mean, that book has had an enormous impact on me to this day. Because it talks about a couple different ty types of people that you generally see in the military. The careerist that cares about nothing but their career 
and steps on whoever they need to step on to get as far as they want to go. All kinds of types in that book. Fantastic book, though. Good story. I tell you, and, and the greatest compliment somebody ever paid to me because I, I had such an impact on me. I was leaving the battalion as a company commander. I donated that book to the battalion library, and the battalion commander at the time said, he goes, yeah, because you're Sam Damon. I'm like, I wouldn't say that, but thank you very much. Okay? That's the kind of impact books can have. Movies never have that kind of impact. They can be good, but there has not been a single really, really good movie I've seen that wasn't, the, the book wasn't about 10 times better. There's some amazing stuff out there. Stuff you can really get into. All right? Other questions, comments? Anything at all? Yes, please. Uh, with the rising complexity of technology and what's going on in the world, uh, are we looking at all of changing how we educate junior enlisted Marines? Uh, the majority of Marines I've worked with uh, have never received a class on tactical planning, decision making, how to think critically. Is there any examination of that right now? Funny you should ask. Absolutely there is. Um, if, you, if, if you're that curious about it, uh, I put out training commander, uh, command, commander's guidance for TCOM. And the first two tasks are directly related to what you just talked about. The first one is we're writing a new MCDP on learning. Because everything we do is about learning. Why is it important? How do you go about it more efficiently? And then the second thing is we have to change our entire training and education culture to get away from telling people what to think and getting at teaching them how to think, how to be critical thinkers. In industrial age process, how many of you sat in a classroom, kind of like you are today, listen to somebody flap their gums, kind of like you're doing today, except there's not a test after this one. So you, take, you memorize facts, you take the test, you regurgitate the, te the facts onto that test, and then you promptly flush the toilet, forget about it, move on, right? How efficient is that as a learning model? Not very. When you got a lot of people, you got to move really fast, you don't have a lot of choices. Okay? That's how we got to this place over time. And we cemented it in place by all the things we do at the TCOM headquarters to inspect formal schools management, lock people into that model, which we have to change. We need an information age model that's problem posing, that gets after making people think and work at something, as a group even, not just individually, but as a group. Because when you come to it yourself by figuring it out and working at it, with the help of a cadre of folks that are coaching, teaching, and mentoring, you learn much better. The problem we have right now is we're focused on process. The process of running a formal school, the process of presenting instruction. We're trying to change the entire focus to the product we're putting out, which is that Marine or sailor that goes through our schools, any one of our schools. What do they understand? And what are they retaining when they get out to the operating force? Okay? That, those are the two most important things. So we're trying to change that entire focus. How it will end up, I'm not sure. I'm seeing a number of different things out there that's pretty promising. Some of them are very technology-oriented, but we have to get at it a different way. Again, going back to books, there's a book called The New Education by Kathy Davidson, Professor Kathy Davidson. She talks about exactly that, the challenges at the university level. A folks more focused on how high their attrition rate is for, their, for the folks applying to get in, we're very selective. Okay, that's nice. And then the reputation of their professors. They wrote a bunch of books. They're really tough graders. Okay, that's nice. How about what those students know and what they're able to do when they get out of college? Maybe a little bit more important? Okay, those are the kind of things she talks about. We're actually trying to get in touch with her to bring her in to talk to her about this stuff and see how we can do things differently because we absolutely have to get at it. Most of our junior folks, officer or enlisted, but in particular enlisted, generally wait to be told what to do. Not all of them. How do we get that bias for intelligent action? So they understand coming out of boot camp, in the absence of specific direction, if you have intent, you need to take action. Don't just sit there and wait. In 1992, the Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines. We had a Lance Corporal that was out there, stationed out there had lived in uh, Washington State when Mount St. Helens erupted, and all the ash came down, and then it rained, and you saw the effects of that ash got really heavy, collapsed buildings and everything else. Well, he saw the hangars with all of our aircraft in them, and said, Jesus, somebody didn't get up there and sweep that stuff off. We're going to lose all of our aircraft. So he took it upon himself, climbed up there almost every day, probably a couple times a day, kept sweeping them off, 
and it rained a lot in the Philippines, so it rained almost every single day. And when all that finally cleared up, when the ash stopped coming down, the only hangars still standing were ours. Everybody else had lost their hangars and the aircraft in those hangars. How the hell did that happen? I swept them off. That's the kind of intelligent bias for action we need to have throughout our ranks in the Marine Corps, all day, every day. Because we rely on things like the ability to communicate until it's shut off. We rely on GPS until it's shut off. In some ways, what makes me more concerned about GPS is it gets spoofed. And they lead you to your logistics patrol to a location where there's a, a welcoming committee waiting there in ambush. If we don't have Marines that aren't paying attention, looking around, don't understand how to use a map and compass, how many of them are gonna realize, whoa, hang on a second, GPS is telling me to go somewhere, this is not looking right. All right, moment of truth. How many of you blindly follow the GPS in your car right now, even when it sends you in the, to the wrong place? How many of you have done that? Okay, we've got some honest folks in here. You know it's happened, more, it's happened to more of you, okay? That's a challenge too. We've got a lot of challenges out there. We've got to be able to deal with it because we don't get the option to kind of go, oh, that's it. This conditions have changed. I no longer know what to do. I'm just going to sit and wait. Answer your question? Yes, sir. Thanks, sir. You're welcome. Who else? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Um, with the kind of success of the seminars for the enlisted PMEs, is there talks or anything in development to create more seminars for different type of uh, professionals in the Marine Corps? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, part of the challenge we have here at TCOM is when we come up with bright new ideas of more seminars, other things, the operating forces are like, enough already. Stop, please, you're killing us. There's too many already. So would we like to do that? Yes. But what's to keep folks out in other units, kind of like we're doing right now, spending a Friday afternoon conducting a PME and talking about these things? When you were out in the operating forces, how many times did that happen with you? Good. That's okay. So the, the PME was good, and that, that was one unit. But uh, me, I went to the career course seminar. My ability to sit down with uh, other Marines from other MLS and have that conversation, uh, I think that was uh, a greater like educational impact on me. Uh, talking with uh, Marines from the wing, and everything from the band. Great. Uh, and I think that's where the seminar. Yep. And we're going to continue to do it. The challenge we also have, especially on the listed side, is the mass, the numbers of folks. Because we can't require something unless we can get everybody the opportunity to go do it. And that's where we start running into problems, because we have a lot of folks in, in our listed ranks. Okay? So that, that's part of the challenge. Okay? Because we'd love to do more, but there's two parts to that challenge. Okay? What else you got? Sir, yes, please. In your guidance, you talk about uh, potentially moving TBS back to Education Command. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Potential effects on that? We're looking at the effects, because that's one of the questions I have, second and third order effects. How do we do that? Or why would, do we need to do that? Because as we just discussed, if, uh, if we can, if we, and we're looking at the analysis that's being done, if, it can be, if we can achieve the intent, which is how do we lay the hook in to the brand new officers, immediately get them to understand essentially what we've been talking about right here, get them to absolutely understand and commit themselves to this of course, for, the long, for however long they're in this uniform, Okay. If we can set that hook in successful without having to move TCOM, or excuse me, move uh, TBS to Education Command, fine. If we can accomplish that intent, I'm okay with that. But we've got to set that hook. We've got to lay that in. People have to understand, you just joined a profession, there's an expectation of this in this profession, and you've got to live up to it. Okay? Thanks. What else you got? Sir, yes, your please. Article, in your article, sir, you were talking about competitive exams for school. Resident school, sir, will, will we be implementing a type of GRV or GMAT, sir? No, because that's entirely too broad. Um, that's to see if people have what it takes to um, participate in an academic environment at the graduate level. Um, it's very, very broad. Um, doesn't mean you can't take it. I, I took the GRE. I did well in some portions, but I completely bolowed the math because that's always been a dirty four-letter word to me. Um, so, but it, I did well enough for the other one that I actually was offered a scholarship when I got into, uh, got back to Marquette University for a um, graduate degree. 
but that has a specific purpose. The entire purpose of entrance exams would be, one, to test them to see if they have the knowledge they should have been gaining since the last PME experience. Okay, have they been doing everything we've just been talking about here? And the other piece is, so that you don't, when you, at command and staff, uh, and McWar, especially at command and staff, they spend about the first month or two just getting people back into an active environment and get them to be able to think, write, participate meaningfully. Some pick it up faster than others, but it's tough. How, how about starting right off at a dead sprint? Because everybody, we know everybody there is ready to go, they've been keeping up. Um, so, and it wouldn't just be that, that the results of that exam would then be used for the selection board that looks at performance and use the combination of the two to decide who goes to school. Because part of the problem we have right now is there are too many people that consider going to PME course is just checking the block. Again, PME has a purpose. Formal PME has a purpose. Again, we all need to be smarter. None of us will ever be smart enough. How do you keep after that? It's not just MOS professionalism, which is absolutely required, but it's all the intangibles, all the other things we talk about when things don't go the way they're supposed to go. How many of you seen the movie um, Avatar? Not everybody's seen that movie Avatar, are you kidding me? What's that colonel's name in that, in that movie? Uh, the, I can't remember his name. But one of the things that impressed me, aside from the fact that he's an asshole, um, one of the things that impressed me was when things really started going south on him, when they're in the middle of their big attack, was he ever caught short? Did he always have something, he just immediately did something to react to the situation and, and try and win? Until, of course, they put the arrow through him, then, then that, you know, that kind of ended the whole thing. But I mean, it's that ability, again, only a movie, but it's that ability to think on your feet and adjust, recognize what's going on and adjust. DARPA did a study in 1977. They looked at 41 different combat engagements from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And there were two very, very important ingredients in success every single time. is the ability to recognize when conditions are changing and adjust to it quickly before the enemy does. I mean, that's the essence of the OODA loop, right? How many, you know what the, how many don't know what the OODA loop is? Nobody willing to admit it? Observe, orient, decide, and act. That's what we're talking about. Observe what's going around you, orient yourself, I understand what's going on here. Make a decision and act. If we do that faster than, than anybody that comes against us, it doesn't matter what they're using. We're going to kick the living crap out of them. They can't keep up. Because the, by the time they make a decision, they start acting, what they're doing is irrelevant. Okay? We've changed conditions on them. They can't keep up. All right? Who else? Answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? Free shot? What about anything going on in the Marine Corps? Anything at all? You know, the ones responsible for implementing the three minutes between events on the CFT? Yeah. Do you know that? Okay. We're also the ones that are raising the, the bar for the PFT. Of course, the common I had a little bit to do with that. Told us to do it. But it's all about making Marines fit more fit. So people kind of bitch about it and then get on with it. Because Marines always rise to the occasion, right? Chief. Suppress the enemy, bring your buddy back, so you can go to reinforce the position. We don't have that. How many times do we do a CFT and you've got somebody out there to guide you and tell you what to do? It doesn't make chronological sense. It never has. So just, as we discussed three minutes, you just make it think of it. Yeah. No, you're making some good points. Um, and we'll have some folks that really get into that and do that according to the intent. And then we'll have others that, yeah, whatever. That's not important. We don't need to cover that at all. McMap, how many times have you been out in McMap and no values training was conducted? Yeah, you know what, that's kind of squishy. I don't want to touch that one, just forget it. That's one of the most important parts of McMap, is that values training. 
Okay? When it comes to PFT, how many have been out there with the PFT and seen people doing improper pull-ups and improper sit-ups or crunches and nobody says a word? Yeah, nobody says a word. How's that measuring fitness? If they're not even doing the stuff right. That's part of the challenge. That's up to us to make sure it's being done right. A couple of the changes we're talking about with the PFT, instead of crunches, how many of you have ever done a plank? An athletic trainer came up to the commandant down when he was visiting Marsoc and said, hey, commandant, you need to quit doing crunches. You're killing your young Marine's lower back. Ruin them. Terrible exercise for the lower back. Do planks. What was the commandant's reaction? Okay, he gets down and does a plank just to see what it's like, to see how long he could do it. Maybe a minimum of one minute, maximum of three minutes. We're testing it right now to see if that's something that we could do. When it comes to the CFT, to try and make things a little bit more realistic, part of it is three minutes between events because how many actually get a break in, in combat? Okay, that's the whole point, combat fitness test. The other piece is, why the heck are we throwing somebody over our shoulder and carrying them? How many of you that have been in combat have seen somebody do that under fire? Throw somebody over the shoulder and run through fire? Once, twice, how'd it work out for them? It was effective? Okay, all I ever saw was drag to cover. Run out there, grab something, drag them behind cover as quickly as possible, then get them treated. Hopefully after throwing some smoke grenades to, so that you can have a little bit of cover. Concealment, actually, okay? So that's one of the things we're talking about doing is drag to cover instead of fireman's carry, okay? Because the idea behind it being uh, we want to save as much time as we possibly can when we're running the CFT, and part of the challenge you have is waiting around to be the, the fireman's carry dummy. So is there a better way to do it by doing a drag to cover? Either mannequin or some sort of sled. We're looking at a couple different options. Commandant's interested. We'll see if it goes anywhere. But again, there's, there, there are ways to improve. Again, nothing is ever good enough. We need to find ways to get better. The Army's got a massive combat fitness test they're testing right now. Looks like it's going to be pretty difficult if they follow through all the way on it. I don't know if they will or not, okay? But it's going to be kind of difficult, all right? But it's all about getting better, getting people in better shape, all right? What else you got? Sure, since we're talking about the, yes, please. the, the PFT piece here, uh, is there any talks of doing a beep test? Uh, therefore, you can't... A beep test. So I'll, I'll, I'll probably let some of my experts here, but really it's uh, the British do it, but it's, it's a beep. Uh, let me go down up on the beep. Why not? Propose it. Send it into uh, the Force Fitness Division. We'll look at it. He just became the most popular guy in the room, didn't he? <laughs> 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 <These guys won. laughs> no, that's, that's the thing. Is That probably would be a better way of getting at it. Because what, we're, what are we trying to measure? Upper body. Upper body strength. If that's the best way to do it, that's something we ought to look at. But I tell you, the number of folks out there that don't want to be challenged any more than they absolutely have to, you know, if the minimum weren't the good minimum, it wouldn't be, if the minimum were not good enough, it wouldn't be the minimum folks, those kind of folks. Yeah, there was just an article that came out saying, you know, uh, the Marines had huff and puff their way to a third class PFT and barely passed the thing. Well, the bar just ra got raised a little bit, so you're gonna have to huff and puff a little harder. I'm kind of like, well, what are they doing down there in the first place? Last PFT I ran, I, I passed a 21 year old and at the, the finish line, I'm like, yeah. You've got to be kidding me. How did I pass you? I don't know. <laughs> Say, please. Sir, uh, just getting off what Captain Young was saying. Uh, so are you the beep test guy? He uh, did gesture in your direction quite often, so. Are, okay. Uh, you're always welcome to come out and uh, try it out if you want to, sir. Uh, it's on the table, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's the thing is what we need is um, it's, the, it's the data testing to see what kind of impact it's going to have on people. Like we just raised the minimum amount of pull-ups for females, but it was based on some scientific studies that indicated probably only about maybe one to two percent of females would have a problem by us raising the bar a little bit. Sir. So that's what we have to look at. Because um, not everybody has the same attitude about physical fitness and, and the challenges of physical fitness. Um, they ought to, but they don't. So if we start doing things that make it a lot more difficult and people, a lot of people start falling out at the bottom end, we got a problem. You gotta, you gotta study it first, take a look at it, and then kind of gradually shift it a little bit, and everybody moves, everybody gets a little better. Please. Sir, uh, I don't mean to prolong the whole aspect of the physical fitness part, but instead of, uh, uh, everyone seems to think that you gotta up the numbers. Like, for instance, ammo count, the 
do a 120 ounce count variation with two minutes, that's you're compromising natural spinal alignment, incorrect movements, so you're increasing, why not just increase the supervisor requirement? Maybe for select specific grades, gotta be supervised X amount of Marines at a specific time. Uh, I'm just curious if that's ever been considered in regards to just, okay, let's just up the numbers. Well, that's, that's part of the three minute requirement between events. Because what that means is you show up, if you manage it properly, if units manage it properly, you show up at a given time and you take the test. One uh, monitor stays with you through the whole test. And you move through the test with that one monitor who's monitoring only you. And that's the case of making sure the monitors have the moral courage to say, nope, that doesn't count, Captain. Nope, that doesn't count, Major. Nope, that doesn't count, Lieutenant Colonel. Okay, or Master Sergeant, or Sergeant Major, you know. That's where we're running into problems. And so when the older folks are having problems or not doing things properly, the younger folks are like, that's what I'm doing. Okay? What else we got? Yes, please. I have a quick question on uh, physical fitness standards. So if the people who are just trying to make the minimum are getting away with it, why not get rid of the third class and redesignate the classes so that we have a lower or a higher bottom? People who are the people who are getting 300 to 300 instead of keeping like up the ante every time. Challenge the ones who are minimum, like barely scraping by. Weed them out if we have to, and then improve overall. Okay, whose call is that, Sergeant? All, all of us, right? Yeah, because that's the thing is if you're. It, I would question the ability of a Marine, if they're getting a third class in the PFT or the CFT, I would question their ability to keep up in a tough situation. Do you want that person, do you want that challenge in a combat environment when they can't really keep up? Okay, so it's incumbent upon us to help them improve, figure out what's going on. That's the whole reason why we have force fitness instructors now. And uh, they just briefed me on an app that's coming out that can help monitor folks' performance on that to help them get better, to help the force fitness instructor identify who's those third class PFTers, who's the folks that are barely keeping up, and help them, cause them to improve. He also, Kamana just also decided we're gonna pay for athletic trainers and we're spreading them out across all, all over the place. You got them over here, they're fantastic. But we're trying to spread them out across the Marine Corps so we can get smarter about PT and we can get smarter about injury recovery. Okay, so we can help people get better. But we can't help people's motivation if it's not there. All right, leaders, every single one of us is leaders. We have, to, that's us. We have to set the example and then we have to make sure they toe the line also. And when it comes to them not doing it, we have to take the necessary steps. How many of you have seen, there's two words that should never go together in the English vocabulary, that's fat Marines, okay? How many of you have seen overweight Marines and somebody was defending them saying, well, they're a good Marine. We're not gonna hold them accountable, okay? It's unsat. But in true, true Marine Corps fashion, Marine Corps appreciation, go to another service base, especially the Army. The Army's having a lot of problems. I was just one on yesterday. Oh my God. Okay? So at least we're not them. But I tell you, again, it's up to us. All right? What else you got? I'll stay here all day if you want. It's just Friday afternoon, you know, 1530. Please. Okay, um, cost money. The Army's actually doing that. They're, putting, they're hiring nutritionists and athletic trainers for the units. Army's got a lot more money than we do, okay? But what I would tell you, <laughs> you're gonna laugh when it, it goes back to reading, all right? I've read quite a bit about nutrition, all right? There's a lot of interesting stuff out there. Um, there's one called Wheat Belly. It talks about the negative effects of wheat because of the genetic changes they've made wheat over the last 15 to 20 years or longer. That's really not having good effects on people. Uh, there's another one called it starts with food. All the different types of food that we eat that cause inflammation in our bodies and causes problems, especially as we get older. And we're putting it into our mouth. We don't even know what the effects are until we remove it from our diet. I mean, it's all out there. Some of it's garbage, but some of it's really, really good stuff. And understanding what you're putting in your mouth. The most powerful drug you're ever going to take in your entire life is what you put in your mouth three times a day, seven days a week. Because that's what it is. It has chemical effects on you. So if you eat like crap, guess how you're gonna feel? Garbage in, garbage out, right? 
All right? I'm not perfect at it. My wife and I slide off occasion. I feel like crap for a day or two until I get back on my normal regimen. But it has an enormous impact on you. You just never know until you do it right. That, it starts with food, um, espouses this thing called the Whole30, where you do 30 days without eating any of the things they say cause inflammation, which is a lot of stuff. And it makes it kind of hard to shop for it. Because if you remove all that stuff and you realize the impact it's having on you because it's no longer there, and you reintroduce things one at a time, preferably the good stuff, and see what kind of impact it has on you, it's eye-opening. We've done the Whole30, and it makes you feel completely different has enormous impact. Most people have no idea. Okay? Please. Sir, Major Nagel, I've read the book and done the whole 30. Okay. It would be almost impossible to do that eating in the Marine Corps town hall. You're right. So That's why we're, we're, we're focusing on across the Marine Corps getting better with the whole nutritional aspect. Um, the, the, the challenge we have is all the young folks, um, if they don't eat the stuff in the chow hall, they order from Domino's. Okay, so we're trying to get, ra get away from the fast food options or at least place them a little further, like after the salad bar and after the good stuff. Um, we've got nutritionists working with the folks who decide what goes in those chow halls. We're trying to get better at that, but you're exactly right. And it's even harder when you're in the field. How nutritious are MREs? Okay, um, it's hard when you're deployed. It's hard when you travel. Um, but again, it's, it's about choice you make, and sometimes the choice to go without is a good choice too. Right. Well, part of what we're we've been talking about is at entry level training, boot camp, and OCS, making better decisions with regards to what's offered them. Colonel Williamson, do you want to talk about the uh, the fit, the nutrition stuff that uh, to help them with the heat and uh, to perform better and all the physical activities going on at OCS in the chow hall, please? Uh, sure. You're talking about the chow hall, what the, the different color, color system. Yeah. So, so the the performance nutrition plan is uh, is changed probably since when you all came through off the chance school from what you know. It, it, uh, it starts off with the education and everything we're talking about, the war athlete uh, uh, mindset of being able to fuel. So talking about fueling correctly, uh, we had uh, a great uh, course this morning from those from MFI. It's about how, how, you, how you engage them with your physical fitness program, starting off with dynamic stretching, you know, break up the fascia, make sure their bodies are ready to perform, to perform at a high level, you recover, you refuel the body. So we all we have uh, instituted the performance nutrition pack as well, the fourth meal. The fourth meal has been going on OCS for about a year now. And now, sir, I believe it's at the uh, recruit depot. It is, well. yep. Uh, to make sure that uh, they're, they're getting their, their full body recovery. Uh, and, and OCS, I'm not sure when we're scheduled to be on, but I believe that throughout the Marine Corps, the Chow Hall, we're going to come up with a coloring system. So I think, uh, as you were bringing up to your point, to identify those healthy food options. Uh, so even at OCS, where, where there's a you know, limited amount of time for them to make choices, that color coding helps them. That now they've received the information, they have the opportunity to make choices, uh, and, 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 and hopefully it uh, creates a holistic approach to their health so that, uh, that we truly are developing warrior athletes, not just giving them calories and expecting them to perform without making sure they have the right knowledge of how to do it. Great, thank you very much. So there is recognition, it is moving slowly, but it is moving. Um, but again, it also helps when the leadership is harping on that with our young Marines. Um, as a battalion commander, I can't tell you how many times I look out my window and see a, an another Domino's truck pull in the parking lot, and another one, and another one, because that's what the Marines, well, that's, that's what they're gonna eat. Out there at 29 Palms, one of the mantras we had is get out of the, your barracks room. Get out and do things. There are things to do at 29 Palms, contrary to popular belief. You can do all kinds of stuff. Instead of sitting in your room, eating pizza, playing video games, and drinking. Okay? We've got to get them out of that mode. We first of all, we have to know what's going on in the barracks, which I would, I would tell you that in many cases our units don't know what's going on. You know, the, the, we're, um, my inspector general was walking through the barracks and he was talking to the young Marines in there and he's like, how many of your officers and staff has walked through the barracks? They said, oh, they never do. The only officer we've seen walking through here was the CG. Because I walk through there on a regular basis trying to see the conditions in the barracks and making sure we're fixing things in a timely manner, especially air conditioning, the 29 poems. But there, that's, and then, that, who, who's that on? So if you don't even know what's going on in the barracks, are you gonna know what they're pick, eating in the chow hall? Okay, engage leadership, get involved. Help our young folks make better decisions. Okay, because some of them are also making the decision to, we've got to, it, the, it's cropped back up in, in a big way. Numbers are going up. Unfortunately, I get the reports almost daily basis. 
either attempts or success. And it's just, it's appalling. And what I wonder is how many young Marines, if somebody took the time to talk to them and engage with them and saying, hey, look, you're a valued member of this team, we really care about you. Would that have been enough to prevent them from doing what they did? I don't know. Okay, other questions? Anything at all? I sincerely appreciate your time today. I hope you take this stuff to heart. This is about a profession. This is about studying and getting better every single day. And if you believe it's too much, I want to think about your line of work, okay? Because it's about those young Marines. And as Secretary Mattis said, the price of a lack of competence in our profession is filling body bags until you figure it out. It's not a good way to do it. Thanks. Carry on, please.